2023. I think I think it's an amazing event, and I'm, I'm really daunted by the fact that the, there's at least 60, 70 people uh, looking in. It feels like you're in a kind of a dark room uh, with these kind of one-sided mirrors, and you can't see anybody else, but everybody's seeing you. So it's a constrained space. But um, I'm assuming everybody's friendly and nice, and uh, also a bit frightened uh, because just listening to Naomi before lunch and, and she covered so much and, and, you know, kind of feel like I'm, I'm not the keynote. I'm a bit like, a, I'm not even the dessert. I'm probably some kind of snack, you know, besides Naomi's feast. But anyway, I'm amongst friends and um, hopefully we can make it a useful uh, next 45, 50 minutes. I'm going to talk for about half an hour. Um, and then just leave much more time for open kind of questions and things, yeah? Um, I mean, the title of, of the presentation is there, it's Decolonizing Bibliography is Referencing and Citational Practices. With a lot of this work in decolonizing, I was just talking earlier on about, <clears throat> just when we were starting up, it's like, how do you decolonize? It's a bit like that, you know, how do you, that master's house, how do you, we, you know, I know that we, Naomi said that we, you know, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, but that's kind of what we've got, yeah? And so sometimes I think, and I was, this is something that Paul Gilroy said to me a few years ago when I, we, did a, we were doing a seminar together and I asked him that question. And he said, maybe sometimes only the master's house, master's tools can dismantle the master's house. And I think it's a, I suppose the way I see it is a kind of baby in the bath water not everything in the master's house is necessarily problematic and it's about repurposing uh, but also i think that we need to uh, realize that um, some of the tools that the master uses don't belong to the master yeah they are tools that have been stolen and appropriated or misrepresented now think of one example of that is something like say the idea about rationality and reason we associate that with the european enlightenment we associate that with western kind of academic thought uh, by implication that somehow non-Western non people, I mean, Naomi talked about Edward Said's work, yeah, the Oriental is, isn't completely reasonable or lacks the capacity to engage in the social contract and those kind of things. Well, that's not true, you know, reason is as old as humanity. Um, you know, reason is not just used by people who write and read books, reason is used by everybody particularly people who live close to the land. And I think we need to find new ways of identifying maybe some of the enlightenment, the good things about the European enlightenment and say, these don't belong to Europe or to whiteness. These belong to humanity, yeah? So I think we need to have a more nuanced way. And in fact, you know, the irony is that I'm gonna be talking about citation and bibliographies and referencing, uh, and yeah, I'm gonna be using citations. So, so I think it, it raises then it's kind of these paradoxes, but we, kind of life is a paradox. Um, so, and, and as I said, if we could just go on to the next slide, yeah. I'll just go back a second. I'll just, I'll just finish, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, yeah. This is the, one of the dangers when somebody else is driving the car, but never mind. Uh, so anti-racist scholars, as I said, have been working in this field for many years around tackling racism and things, but and, and, and you know, in a wild variety of fields. But academia has kind of, it's really been the last 15 years since academia has kind of, um, you know, become a focus of uh, some of these challenges. And I think, you know, certainly we talk about institutional practices and recruitment and retention and, 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 and attainment and all these questions. But, you know, I think only more recently have, have, have we started to, um, focus attention on citational practices. Uh, publishing houses are key areas of promoting equity and diversity, yeah? And there's a whole field called citational justice, which goes beyond the kind of surface level, kind of diversity kind of agendas where you might be saying we need more black authors uh, to the whole very nature of citation practices. So from Sarah Ahmed argues, the complicity of citational practices in reproducing the world around certain bodies, yeah? So that's the kind of challenge that we're setting is how can we challenge these practices that reproduce the world around the certain bodies. And in that previous presentation that uh, Naomi gave us, there was that uh, amazing um, clip on, um, on, on how Google and how the search engines can reproduce those bodies, certain bodies. And I think, you know, the way we reference and cite as well does that.
So in this sense, the practice of citing or determining what text and what writers to reference, you know, to build up a case becomes a political act that uh, to establish and uphold the legitimacy and authority of over overwhelmingly white scholars. Yeah. So that's what we kind of, in a sense, problematizing is these 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 um, uh, practices that that of citation themselves. Um, so we can just go on to the next. Uh, Next slide now, yeah. So as well as challenging this kind of neoliberal market logic, uh, which you know is driven by research excellence framework and things like that, the way in which academic labour now has become you know commoditized and politicized, if you like, uh, and how that impacts academics' careers and scholarship. Uh, I'm also going to question uh, how knowledge is remembered and reproduced, and how histories are narrated and by whom, yeah. So and and there's a this, and this is kind of the field in which we're going to be operating. So I'm going to explore citational justice and try then to offer some practical ways to deal with that. But just to just kind of, you know, what do we mean by citational practice? There's, there's lots of written on this, but I, I really like this uh, issue, issue QR, uh, QE, Cook and for Frith's uh, definition. They say that it, citational practice is a bit, a bit like a kind of an infrastructure, you know, that picture there of, 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 of an infrastructure, a city infrastructure. And, and they say that they, it's, it's a kind of a discursive colonial infrastructure. Uh, layers of discursive infrastructure enables us to analyze the role citations play in shaping that which is built upon them, yeah? It's a kind of self-referential thing. Uh, and um, Reed says something really interesting, says that, uh, there are kind of four ways in which we can be, think about citational practice, and some of pe some people give more nuanced ones. But one is the way in which citational practices are about inclusiveness, and of course, if it's about inclusiveness, it, it's not it's not a democratic inclusion. It's just building certain bodies of inclusivity, yeah. Uh, and in fact, almost like they talk about that as writing, which might include automated data outputs. It's about relationally defined how it serves different interests. So, you know, citation is not a neutral kind of thing. It's, it's always serving an interest. It's alliance brokering. Writing creates alliances amongst groups. And there you have these cliques. And then you almost have a kind of those that then, you know, achieve more influence and power will then start to reinforce each other's power. And all of a sudden it becomes this, um, this act of preserving privilege as opposed to it actually being about accessing the kind of wider knowledge base. And, but but this is also this notion of mission critical essential to the function of the end product it shapes and supports. And in that sense, it functions as an infrastructure, yeah? Uh, you know, so, so these processes kind of embed it and structure it in this infrastructure. So I just want to go to the next slide and just remind us before we consider di diving into some of these um, <coughs> discursive uh, kind of practices, uh, it's worth reminding us um, what coloniality is all about. Um, and, you know, it, and, and in a very general sense, it, colonialism can be seen as a project whereby a political force asserts its power over a dependent people and or area. And it makes it, it can take many shapes depending on, on a whole range of local and geopolitical factors. But broadly, we can think about those three types of colonialism, settler colonialism, yeah? large numbers of settlers claim land and become the majority. And here, a, a logic of elimination. This is physical elimination, you know, it's kind of embodied elimination, but you can see how, in some senses, you need some kind of model justification for elimination. And therefore, that's where the kind of, in, the, the, if you like, the epistemological and the pedagogical domain comes in, but we'll come back to that. Planter colonialism, typically associated with the transatlantic slave trade. Here, the colonizer institutes mass production of a single crop, sugar, coffee, cotton, or rubber. And I guess you could see the way in which uh, academic production itself has become a kind of a colonial commodity. Yeah, The way in which, which, um, uh, which uh, colonization opened up new uh, potentialities, new industries, new opportunities for Western scholarship, if you like. And you can see the way in which, um, you know, say things like international studies operates and the way in which even you could argue internationalization of higher education itself is a kind of a kind of a planter colonialism, if you like, or, or, or and then or extractive colonialism, maybe, you know, here is where the aim is to build wealth by extracting raw materials and goods found in a particular locale. So you might argue that, in, you know, international students bringing in money 
is a kind of, you know, it's human goods that have been brought in. And it's interesting how the government has now announced that they, they'll allow students to come, but not their dependents, which I think further confirms this, my suspicion that this is just another modern form of uh, coloniality. So we must not forget that colonialism was first and foremost an economic project. We can never, never lose sight of that fact. It was an economic project which sought to extract wealth for Western nations, especially the elites, at the expense of indigenous people. And this was done through enslavement, through indentured labor, and through physical, and of course, epistemic genocide. And that's kind of where we're gonna be focusing uh, some of our uh, attention now. So next slide, please. So I suppose the question for me is how is Western scholarship and academia implicated in this project? And uh, it, I mean, Western scholarship and academia has played a significant role in the colonial project and it has, but, but it's kind of hidden uh, and it's only now becoming kind of excavated, if you like, exposed, both in, both in terms of justifying coloniality and the violences of coloniality and in facilitating kind of colon, uh, colonization in non-Western societies, kind of administration and things like that. And one way in which that scholarship supported colonialism was to promote the idea of Western superiority and the notion that non-Western societies and others were inferior, uh, lacked civility, lacked intellectuality, um, uh, could not be trusted, if you like, you couldn't work with them, and therefore they were in need of Western intervention. And this justification for colonialism was based on theories of race, which categorized people into hierarchies based on physical and cultural characteristics, yeah? It also helped to facilitate the colonization of non-Western societies by providing knowledge and expertise to colonial administrators and officials. And this included anthropologists, linguists, geographers, and other experts who were employed by colonial governments to gather information and conduct research on the societies they were colonizing. And this knowledge was used to help to govern and control non-Western populations to exploit their resources. And on this slide, I've just kind of, um, couple of pictures just to kind of uh, juxtaposing the, the two kind of things there. Uh, this one on the right, Terra uh, Nullius, 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 yeah, sorry, I can't pronounce that word. Um, it's a, it literally from Latin means territory without master. And this was a legal uh, concept that was developed by colonial colonialists to appropriate lands and simply by sticking a flag saying, oh, nobody's living here, we can't see a house here. So this is, um, this is land that we can take over. And then of course, a whole lot of structures, legal frameworks, kind of jargon and contracting and everything else, administrative processes come in there to give kind of, give legal kind of sanction to this appropriation, stealing, if you like, of the loot. The one on the left is an interesting one. It's, I don't know if anybody if it is in Oxford, but if you go to Oxford, uh, the Oxford Martin School was formerly the old Indian Institute. And this was a, it was a kind of a, like a college that was established in 1883, uh, which contained a library, a lecture theater, rooms, and a museum. And its mission, I'm going to quote its mission from the time, quote, to present to the eye a typical collection of facts, illustrations, and examples, which will give a concise synopsis of India, of the country, and its material products of the people and their model condition. And at one level, this sounds quite a kind of neutral inquisitive term, but actually what, what, the, what it was really was about, it was to, is to tell the Indians what they are, to be able to construct literature, even re reinterpret um, their, their own writings. And a lot of these Oxbridge scholars were, I mean, the, the chap, I can't remember his name, who created this, it was a Sanskrit scholar himself. And that building, if that, this should want this all around it has got like Hindu gods and I think that was one of Ganesh there. And so you could, so, so there's a kind of hidden history of coloniality within our you know, so-called August institutions. So I just want to move on now to bring focus a bit more on, on the role of libraries, yeah, just to, going to share a couple of quotes, um, which really, I don't need to say much more, but this, I think, set, sets the challenge. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So one of them is from Michael, M Michael Dudley. Uh, Welcome to the Decolonized Librarian. And, you know, Western academic libraries emerging as they did from an Enlightenment derived epistemology and premised on your own Christian centric knowledge structures retain the legacy of imperialism, whether we consider biased library of con Congress classification subject headings 
the enculturating role of library collections or our libraries, very physical presence on treaty or stolen land. So that's kind of a, you know, saying libraries are just like universities were part of, part of that project. Um, and then there's this quote on librarianship itself. And it says librarianship has been complicit, if not re responsible for perpetuating colonial approaches to knowledge by placing traditional knowledge with Western knowledge, uh, especially in physical libraries established under colonial regimes by failing to maintain the authority of indigenous people who produce the knowledge or by stealing or appropriating the knowledge without appropriate compensation. So, I mean, I think most librarians, I wouldn't hold them responsible. I think one of the things that we shouldn't be doing is holding white people or anybody responsible for the kind of atrocities of coloniality and slavery and everything else. Uh, not, not least because I, do, I think that, that would be foolish to do so. But that doesn't mean that we haven't got a, a duty to do something about that. We start making people responsible. We, we create kind of victimhood and guilt and all that kind of stuff, which isn't helpful. So though because of the internet, we have access to a vast amount of knowledge. Libraries, bookshops, book publishers, and museums retain a powerful role in procuring, publishing, and curating sources of knowledge. In order to break some of the ongoing white privilege, uh, a privilege of white Western male-centered kind of standpoints, there's a need to problematize and disrupt the status quo. And this means not only questioning the content representation and variety within the canon, but we also need to question the very basis upon which the canon or body of knowledge is constructed. Uh, for example, Madril, uh, in, in a, a text called Treasuring Classical Texts, Engagement and the Gender Gap, talks about um, uh, that when speaking of a canon, we must consider how certain knowledge and authors get included or excluded and why. Put more simply, critiquing the canon means exposing the mechanisms of othering that are prevalent within white Western colonial modes. Yeah? And this is characterized as epistemic violence, what Gautry Spivak talks about this. She says, these are ways of othering that function to privilege dominant discourses and power structures while marginalizing others uh, and excluding others, and thus perpetuating inequity uh, and silencing alternative knowledge systems, yeah? Uh, and, and, and that was in a publication called Can the Subaltern Speak? So I just want to now move us on to the, the kind of Western scholarship and this, this idea of the white man's burden, yeah? I think this, this notion of the white man's burden is very much what might give some people within Western spaces, maybe dominant, those at least, a justification as to why they need to hold on to the kind of traditions that, we, that we're grappling with. <clears throat> Through the colonial period and the enlightenment, more generally, we see the entrenchment of two important ideas. First one is this association of the European enlightenment with the moment of history where reason and science triumphed over superstition, yeah? And this rendered the non-Western people either inherently intellectually deficient or as, as the German philosopher Hegel suggested, simply left behind in some kind of evolutionary journey, yeah? So, so they just, we, we wanted to get them to catch up. Accordingly, the higher ideals of enlightenment of reason, natural law, liberty, progress, toleration, fraternity, constitutional government, and separation of church and state were incomprehensible to non-Europeans. That was the argument that Hegel and those philosophers said that, you know, if we present them these ideas, they wouldn't know what, it, what they are, and therefore we just need to govern them, yeah? For Hegel, non-Europeans had the potential to be educated once they overcame their, and this is a quote from his run, native ignorance of freedom, yeah? In fact, Hegel even said that uh, slavery uh, wasn't necessarily a bad thing because when enslaved people then fought for their freedom, they learned about freedom. It's an absurd kind of idea that somehow slavery was a good thing because they, before they became enslaved, they didn't know what enslavement was. Um, and we can discuss that afterwards. But, they, but, he, but the argument is that they could not educate themselves and must be educated by Europeans. That's the white man burden, which requires that they are first subjected to European control and they must assimilate into European culture and ideas, yeah? So this was this idea that, so in terms of citational practice, it, the, the argument would be these are neither Western nor Eastern, they're just advanced ways of you know, communicating knowledge and therefore uh, other people just need to learn these advanced ways, yeah? The other one was by rendering the non-European non others culturally or intellectually primitive. And um, I don't need to say a lot about that, but there's a very famous, this is called, um, uh, this, 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 minute is it was actually spoken in the House of Lords 
by Lord Thomas Babington Macaulay, who was um, a British minister. And uh, he believed that Britain, it was Britain's religious solemn duty to enlighten the heathens. These were the words who lived in perpetual darkness outside of Europe, yeah? Uh, and I say this is famous uh, speech in, in the House of Lords. I mean, you can see it yourself. I'm not going to, maybe I'm not even going to read it because it's, uh, you know, it's not worthy of that. But uh, it kind of just almost completely suggests that Arabic, Indian, there's nothing there of any worth. That, that those languages, those systems, those ideas just mean nothing. It's quite an absurd thing to say if you think about it. If you think about the seat of ancient civilizations is Africa, is the, is the colonized world, is Australia. Yet somehow these ancient civilizations are, are just presented as, as, as barbaric. The irony is that if we go to Greek, let's say Greek, Greco Europe, Roman civilizations, which are themselves ancient, then all of a sudden there's a different kind of view on that. And I would suggest that's partly because that the, those civilizations are constructed as white civilized. In, in racial typographies, Greek, the Greek were seen as the top, yeah. Um, but let's, uh, let, so, so if we boil things down, then the general view that emerges out of colonialism is that non-European, white European people have little to contribute to the modern development of ideas and scholarship other than maybe as objects of study, yeah? So they're okay to be studied, but not to study. Or that because of some unfortunate quirk of history and or genetic endowment, they simply are unable to compete with white Europeans. Uh, and it seems to me the massive dominance of white middle-class European men usually, and, and you know, increasingly from select number of countries in, in kind of citational indices, you can only draw two conclusions. Either, either they are they are kind of genetically endowed and they are racially superior, or you can say that there's something else going on. And so you know you can think about that. So within the construction of racialized worldviews within white Western identities are constructed as, as an absence of identity. That's the other interesting thing is that whiteness is not really whiteness. I always say that whiteness really operates as transparency, as a non-identity, yeah? Nothing that it, it hasn't got to be accountable for itself. It's transparent, individual, objective, rational, progressive. And in contrast, the non-white Western other is presented as a series of racialized tropes, such as exotic, dangerous, irrational, primitive, stupid, ugly, but also sexually promiscuous, victims of oppression, objects of pity, outsiders as fetishes, as exceptional, and sometimes as heroic figures as well. Yeah. So, so this is the kind of um, this is the, if you like, the the binary opposite that's kind of we need to kind of deconstruct and get rid of. So we'll go on to the next uh, next slide. I don't know if you've come across the work of uh, Deleuze and Gottori. Um, quite interesting. I mean, I, I'm a bit reluctant to cite them because we fall into the same trap. Because I think some of these ideas don't necessarily belong to them. We can, uh, in, in a lot of traditions, I think you will find. But they use this kind of these these metaphors of uh, aborescent thought and rhizomatic thought and aborescent means tree-like structures, yeah? And rhizomatic is, uh, is, is this kind of uh, root crops, kind of where there isn't an obvious structure. There's a kind of, if you've got a network, if you like, a kind of network of connections, yeah? So aborescent thought refers to a hierarchical tree-like mode, mode of thinking. It's characterized by central point of origin, fixed hierarchies, linear causality, and binary oppositions, the kind of things we're trying to problematize. And it seeks to establish clear and stable structures, categories, and boundaries. It's aim for organization, stability, and control. This mode of thinking can be seen in various domains, such as traditional Western philosophy, scientific disciplines, and bureaucratic institutions. Yeah. So, so that kind of captures some of the, the kind of ways in which we are now trying to problematize the kind of citational practices that we, we have. If we move on to the rhizomatic thought, then, on the other hand, proposes a non hierarchical interconnected and nomadic mode of thinking. It takes inspiration from the rhizome, which is an underground plant structure that spreads horizontally rather than vertically without a central root. And rhizomatic thought is characterized by multiplicity, non-linearity, connectivity, and a network-like structure. It emphasizes the fluidity of connections, the interplay between different elements, and the emergence of unexpected connections and possibilities. And this thought rejects fixed categories and embraces a more 
flexible and open-ended approach to knowledge and systems. Now, I just want to say that I don't think that this rhizomatic thinking means that anything goes. There is still a kind of a system, there's still a structure. It's just that it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a different way of looking at how those things can connect together. Uh, in a rhizomatic approach to citation, there might appear might be a greater emphasis on making connections between ideas and engaging in a dialogue with multiple sources. It could involve highlighting the interplay between different texts and ideas, rather than simply tracing a linear genealogy. And citations might be used as points of departure for further exploration and as invitations for readers to engage with a network of interconnected concepts and sources. And so though we need to be careful about overgeneralizing Broadly speaking, these contrasting different processes of thought can help us to see the link between colonialism and academic citational practices. So as I said, colonialism involved the imposition of European values and beliefs and practices on colonized peoples, including their language and cultural exp expressions. This includes the aborescent or hierarchical controls of knowledge production and dissemination. In fact, racial hierarchies themselves, if you think about represent a kind of an aborescent view of humanity or the way in which we have these hierarchies of knowledge or theories or practices. Um, and this often resulted in the erasure of indigenous knowledge systems that were more reflective of, of say rhizomatic systems of thought. And sometimes even in the way we engage with students, uh, unless they, they, they engage in this kind of hierarchical way of thinking, we often see them as having to, I don't know, they need to be taught how to think in these ways. Uh, and I think it questions uh, the way in which we might see how people come to knowledge and understanding. So these Europe-centric epistemologies have often been prioritized over the other ways of knowledge, knowing, and scholars from colonized and marginalized communities have been excluded from academic conversations and citation networks as a result. And women as well, I think there's a lot of literature how women uh, tr traditionally were also excluded. Uh, so as a result, citation practices have often perpetuated the marginalization and erasure of non-Western others and non-West white knowledge systems uh, and non-male systems and thinking as well. So efforts have been made to address this issue, including the development of citation practices that prioritize diverse voices and perspectives and the recognition of the importance of decolonizing knowledge production and dissemination. And this includes efforts to acknowledge and incorporate the knowledge systems of marginalized communities including those through citation practices that prioritize sources from these communities rather than from elite communities and spaces. But simply splicing up reading lists to include non-white authors who may themselves have been deploying colonial citation practices does not seem to me to be a solution. And academic citation practices operate like a cartel controlling exercise over the production and dissemination of knowledge. And we kind of know that, we call it game playing. It's interesting, isn't it, how if we call something that's game playing, then it seems acceptable. But if, 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 if as other people who haven't got legitimacy do that, then that might be seen as plagiarism or cheating. And, that, and that's what, you know, what privilege gives you. It allows you to, in a sense, break the rules, but still be seen as okay. And, and we know that in, in REF, kind of the way in which the REF operates, there's all kinds of really, really uh, you know, untruthful practices that are taking place. Uh, so what these practices act, act like a cartel uh, and the control, the dissemination of knowledge, the development of scholars and scholarship and certain ones being prioritized over those. And this is reinforced by publishers and academic disciplinary mechanisms. Uh, you know, the REF is one of them, but just the whole way in which publication takes place and who, who is published and who isn't. And, and that leads to a concentration of power and influence within the academy. And that takes us back to that notion of the infrastructure that we're trying to deal with. So this is not only creates barriers for scholars from marginalized communities, I think, who may struggle to gain recognition and credibility within the academic community. But such practice also contribute to the perpetuation of existing power structures within the academy. For example, citation practice tend to prioritize the English language and scholars from certain institutions or regions. You know, we, we hear about the Russell Group and, 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 you know, Ivy League and that kind of idea. Thus perpetuating existing expulsions of non-Western scholars and non-Western scholarship. So I just want to end up by just giving some ideas, last slide, as to how we move forward. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but um, I've been talking a bit fast. And I'm, oh, 31, let's go, just another five minutes and then we'll, we'll have, a, have a conversation, yeah? So how do we move forward? 
and that I think I like that image of kind of we need to think about ecologies of knowledge, uh, which is more like a kind of rhizomic structure than than these tree like structures of kind of hierarchies of knowledge. <clears throat> so the first I think is recognize that science citation systems for what they are, their filtration and disciplinary mechanisms for performing metrics that consciously and unconsciously function to produce and reproduce dominant discourses and power relations. Hence, we need to rethink citational practice based on a non-hierarchical, decompartmentalized conception of knowledge, which will inevitably confront the logics of neoliberal performance, performative academic practices associated with uh, metrics such as the REF. Um, the second one is, uh, in order to disrupt, disrupt self-serving cliques that reproduce white male hegemony through citing each other, we need to engage in, in what Graham, Antonio Gramsci said was a war of position, you know, to break what Judith Blood to terms the chains of binding conventions. Yeah, that's Judith Butler, by the way. I didn't reference it, but that's, I'm sure somebody else would have said that as well. That means dispute, dis, disputing those systems, disrupting those systems from the inside by rejecting the idea that more citations correlate to research excellence and actively citing historically marginalized scholars. Yeah. I mean, it is a bit absurd, isn't it, that somehow if you get lots of clicks, then that must, I mean, on, on that basis, then we should all be citing Donald Trump because he gets millions of uh, you know, likes for his tweets or something, yeah? And, and just to kind of quote here, uh, this is what Sarah Ahmed said about, she said, citation is how we acknowledge our debt to those who came before us. Those who helped us find our way when the way was obscured because we deviated from the paths we were told to follow. So, but this will only happen if systems of peer review, editors, reviewers, commissioners, PhD examiners are similarly disrupted. So there's a need to disrupt here, to reimagine this field completely. And the next one is to uh, remind ourselves that humans have a deep, deep history. We need to make a distinction between human knowledge production as a natural process and manufactured knowledge that is curated through citation systems. Citation systems, are a kind of, a, as I say, a filtration system. Here we need to reimagine the field or terrain on which scholarship is done. In this regard, we can think of the field as a socially constructed, negotiated and collaboratively produced research site between researchers and research subjects and other stakeholders. And uh, I think in that sense, the, uh, you know, the whole decolonization of research and, uh, and this kind of boundaries between research subjects, research producers, consumers, that all kind of needs to be you know, put into the pot. Let's say we need to remind ourselves that human beings have a deep history, a relationship and technology to the planet, which is often revealed by indigenous peoples from whom we can learn much. The concept of deep history extends beyond the limits of recorded history and seeks to understand the long-term processes that have shaped humanity, including the emergence of complex societies, the development of technologies and language. <clears throat> and though we think of our history and that of the world as, and ourselves through the lens of official accounts, or if you like, the colonial lens, there is a different and much longer unwritten or hidden history contained in oral traditions. How do we cite oral traditions? And the sense of deep history, deep time and place helps us to understand that all our histories, our psychologies and cultures are products of the intimate relationship between nature, species and environments. And so we need to avoid these false dichotomies between human society and culture and non-human animals and nature, which is characteristic of the way which in Western systems of thought. And uh, number five, dominant enlightenment conceptions of knowledge based on reason, rationality, and the Hegelian dialectic, which is based on this negation and separation of belief from fact. We need to question that. Not that we should stop being, re we should stop reasoning, but we need to acknowledge that indigenous knowledge has a rational basis to it. Though the way that knowledge becomes produced or curated or presented or validated and transmitted, it might be quite different to the ways in which, these very narrow ways in which we transmit knowledge through these kind of citation systems that we're all trapped in. And by the way, these citation systems are not that old. You know, you don't need to go into deep history. They're, they're about 150 years old and there's still debates about how you cite, you know, Harvard, you've, you are the, uh, the, uh, and the different disciplines argue it with themselves. And just last, uh, uh, last one, 
is what we call getting away from these kind of hierarchies to ecologies of knowledge. And that's coming back to this picture. Con confront the logic of monoculture of scientific knowledge and, and rigor by identifying other knowledges and criteria of rigor and validity in social practices. Uh, uh, De Souza Santos, who's written a book called Epistemologies of the South, talks about that. He says, this means recognizing plural systems of knowledge that are alternative to modern science or that engage with it in new knowledge configurations. So it, is, it doesn't say that we should get rid of the kind of Western paradigms, if you like, but we need to see them as paradigms amongst other paradigms. So we need to kind of, as we go to these ecologies of knowledge, and that, that should help us to uh, achieve much more inclusive and you know, clearer pictures. Uh, and, and I think that just at the end, and he says that this will enable us to find a bridge, uh, a way to bridge the gap between knowledge from above, if you like, uh, privileged, authorized documents and knowledge from below, if you like, undocumented knowledge of oral, visual and indigenous knowledge. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't kind of rabbled on too long. No, not at all. That was uh, really fantastic. So thank you. We've got um, lots of um, thank yous uh, from people. And um, I have a few questions for you yeah. from the chat. Yeah. Um, we... So if you want to continue putting questions in the chat and also if anybody would like to yeah. raise hands and ask Gernam anything or have a little chat with him, please do. And can um, we jump out, jump out of the presentation, come back to maybe we can see people as well. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yes, there you go. And uh, yeah, I'll start by asking you the questions that we have from the chat. So um, we, this is a question for you. Uh, we literally just had a query from an academic here on our library, librarians teams chat. How would you answer the view that online journals in different countries don't have the same academic rigor and peer review process as we do in the West, but maybe the only source for information on a topic in a developing country? So we and yeah. actually overly fixated on peer reviewed as the only valuable research. So, well, I mean, I think I would say there's plenty of rubbish journals in the West as well. <laughs> in fact, there's 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 so much rubbish. I mean, if you look at scientific journals, I mean, I've been reading somewhere that there's so many articles published in psychology and other subjects that you'd probably have to be reading an article every few hours to catch up and stay up with it. Yeah. So inevitably, what happens when you've got this? Um, complete monopoly, then, you know, that in itself then pushes out other knowledges. Um, I, I mean, in a sense, this is this is one where maybe the master's tools cannot be used to dismantle the master's house. Uh, and we need to just, just see what what the, this whole idea, I mean, if you think about the publishing organization, the people who publish these journals, I, mean, I don't know if you know, but, you know, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like a price in you know, this kind of pricing. So if an article gets cited a lot, it, it's price goes up. And then if you have to want to download it, unless you've got a contract with them, then you have to pay a lot more. So it, it's become a completely commoditized system. And, and there's a global audience for that, you know, uh, and that's because of coloniality. Just like in the previous presentation, we were talking about how, you know, people in India, in Africa want to become white. They want to kind of, as it were, consume. And so you've got this kind of, this has become a global commodity and I'm not quite sure what the solution is. I think that we just need to become a bit more rhizomic and, 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 and part of it is the way in which we assess students' work. Do we penalize students because they haven't referenced the, the, the person who gets referenced a million times? I don't know. I mean, does, does the fact that Donald Trump gets million you know, followers on his, millions on his tweets mean that he's talking a truth? You know, I don't know. You know I haven't got an answer to that, to that question. Maybe the, I mean, some librarians might be able to help me out because I'm not a librarian. Uh, that was great, thank you. Um, I don't have an answer for you either. But um, <laughs> um, another different question for you. Um, how do you think linguistic imperialism fits into this? Uh, the imposition of English language on virtually all scholarly communication. It's, it's again, it's one of these difficult ones where we're using English to have this conversation about, you know, it's, I mean, here, it's a master's tool, isn't it? Uh, and the question is, I suppose one way to do that is to say English doesn't belong to the English, yeah? 
that actually it, it, it's, it's stolen property. And certainly if you begin to look at the words in the English language, you'll find that they're from all over the world. So I think we can start off maybe by co stop calling it English. Um, but I don't know. I mean, what decolonization is not about unraveling and taking us back to some kind of undisturbed, pristine uh, past, because language is in a constant stage of flux. We just need to understand how it functions in imperialistic ways and do, the, do our best to try and confront that. But I don't, I, 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 and, and, and maybe technology might do that nowadays. I'm, I'm writing a lot more in Gurmukhi Punjabi script, partly because I can use Google Translate, but I have to then recheck that. And maybe that's what we should be doing. Maybe we should say we can use technology to trans, transfer you know, ideas into different languages. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe you should try out Punjabi, Michelle. It's, it has some really interesting nuances. <laughs> Um, I would love that, but as I've learned from uh, my numerous attempts at trying to learn different languages, I have no ability to do so whatsoever. I'm just, so maybe Punjabi would be different. I, yeah. <laughs> um, I, you made a really good point there like, about the um, decolonization is not about unraveling, and I know we've talked about this a, a, mm -hmm. the past few years, and yeah, I think that's a really important point because um, you know, that's, I think, one of the fears of many yeah, yeah. white people, I suppose, in, in academia in particular, and probably in government as well, is that, you know, we just want to unravel everything yeah. to do, everything we're doing currently. So Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like, say, climate change and global, you know, the kind of disa climate disaster. I mean, ideally, I mean, do we, do we want to go back to pre-industrial times? We kind of want to create that maybe the environment but you know we have to look forward, don't we? We have to try to deal with the problem as it is, uh, rather than going back to the land and stuff like that. I don't know. You know, uh, I just think that you know what's gone, it's gone. We have to construct new, and that's why I think Franz Fanon was very clear about that in his work. He said, he said, uh, de you know, decolonization is about constructing a new humanity. It's not about in fact, going backwards can feed into all kinds of quite narcissistic and nationalistic and quite fascistic ideas, because a lot of nationalism is based on some on a critique of the present and going back to the past as a way to, as it were, to rescue ourselves. No, I think we need to move forward. Uh, we're going to come to Siobhan next. So, Siobhan, do you want to ask? Yeah, I'd love to hear somebody speak and see faces. I just feel like should we all kind of expose us? Should we all see our faces, humanize this space, yeah? Um, I'll be the first to do so then. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much. That was a really brilliant presentation. And my compliments on explaining rhizomatic thoughts so well. Oh. I find it normally a really difficult concept to get across. I've worked with people on that. But no, I think my question links into it a little bit. And I think what you've just said, especially on the looking forwards front, I mm. think because I, I do a PhD, I'm originally from an academic background, moving into librarianship, and something I sometimes find difficult when looking at this kind of work is trying to think about what the things are that we kind of say the other party to know, like what would you think that we as librarians can do to support our academic colleagues in having this sort of forward thinking and moving towards yeah. a different model of looking <clears throat> at citations and knowledge because i know we are having this discussion and i know that adjacent discussions happen in academic spaces but i always struggle with thinking about how to connect them or how to do that bridging work because that is something i sometimes yeah. feel is missing and i wondered if you any thoughts yeah. on that I mean, I was a, initially I was a scientist. I did science as a degree, and then I moved into the kind of social sciences and politics. So I've kind of got a bit of everything in sociology. And 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 for me, one of the problems is we have these disciplinary kind of boundaries. So the kind of physicists will say, "Look, don't talk about any of this. To this has no relevance whatsoever." And then you've got the people in literature who are talking about, you know, can the subaltern speak kind of thing. And then I think we need to be able to understand we need to have a common language um i have to learn about science now even though i'm not a scientist we, i mean we, we're talking about artificial intelligence things so i think that it's incumbent on anybody who professes to, to be able to teach to research to be able to know about these things it, the, this isn't a specialist subject it's about being human yeah and so that's the way i think we need to present it 
but I, I think we need to avoid some, I mean, don't, don't throw Gottori and Deleuze to uh, a physicist. They'll probably th th throw some instrument at you, yeah. But you can you can you can explain those ideas in, in in lay language, and that's one of the. In fact, I think the reason why I don't like the French post-structuralists because they try to explain reality to us in ways that nobody understands. And and in fact, one of the criticisms of Hegel was that he was so obscure that in fact he was deliberately obscure that nobody understood what he was saying. <laughs> so you know, we just need to speak in a kind of. I mean. I'm a kind of like an imposter in academia, you know, but that's because I can speak a street language and I understand. I, my mum was like a professor and she had no qualifications whatsoever. And I'm looking for, so intelligence isn't speaking coded language. In fact, academic language is just like a language. It's another language, you know, and if we see it just as another language, then we don't put it onto this pedestal uh, and we can break down those boundaries between us as well, yeah. So that's it, really. I think, you know, I'm not sure there's any other solution. But I've got plenty of professors in maths who are interested now and professors in, in other disciplines, in, in what you might, I mean, it's in the hard disciplines and, and the soft. That in itself is a kind of colonial kind of construct, isn't it? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that, Siobhan. Spinning that googly at me. <laughs> Anybody else? I've got lots of faces, but lots of silence. It's a very dystopian kind of world, this online, isn't it? I do have another question from the uh, chat for you. So uh, if we as librarians are not actively interrogating our collections and how and why they have been built the way they have, do we just prop up our arborescent thought systems? I mean, you're not a librarian. <coughs> No, I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I really have, I feel sorry for librarians because the kind of libraries have been dismantled anyway, aren't they? So in a sense, the, tree, the trees are coming down. But I suppose you, if that's an opportunity, you know, because much more information is on the web now on the net. And, you know, we've got AI and to some extent, it might be out of our control. The systems and those infrastructures, those new online infrastructures may well even make it more difficult to uh, dismantle these aberrant structures. Um, I think that it's almost like, if you think of it from the kind of consumer or the user perspective, I mean, what are those resources for? So that students can read something, write an essay, then lecturers can mark it saying, tick, 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 you reference these things and my reading this, yeah? So maybe it's at that point on the kind of ground that we can reimagine the kind of the, the relationship between learning, knowledge, facts, experience, yeah? And one thing I think we do need to do is we need to be much more comfortable with first, second and third person. Well, I think a lot of citational kind of practices tend to privilege the third person, yeah, the kind of the, the observer, as it were, the, the narrator of an idea. And so we need to be comfortable with being inside the idea, not just simp simply separating ourselves from the idea. And, 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 and that's called, I suppose, it's not about subjectivity. I think it's something else. It's, it's back to that, the way in which we all relate to knowledge. We are bodies in knowledge, as it were, as well as thinking about bodies of knowledge. I don't know if that's too philosophical for after lunch, but there you are. <laughs> Maybe, but it did make me think about when I teach referencing, um, the question I always dread is about um, what is common knowledge? Uh, because in, in when you reference things, you don't reference common knowledge. And then students get quite hung up on this and they start to go, but is this common knowledge or do I have to reference this? And I'm like, I don't know. I, <laughs> I think there's a way around that, Michelle, is common knowledge could be seen as your experience, yeah? Um, now, it seems to me that it's really important that if we're going to make comments, judgments about the world, that we, we do recognize our experience, yeah? Because I think that the tradition that we've got at the moment is that you make yourself absent. If you look at, say, the writing of Bertrand Russell, he was really, really kind of hot on that. He says, anything that creeps, anything that suggests that your own personal likes or 
creep into the formulation of your ideas, then that that immediately devalues what you're saying. Yeah, uh, it's almost like you know they want us to behave like robots. Do we want to behave like robots? In fact, not no, because we've got AI to do that. Maybe AI can release us now to be people rather than us trying to become robots. Let the robots be the robots. Well, that actually makes me think of something else I was um, thinking of when you were speaking about um, this kind of new trend of uh, overseas campuses <laughs> of UK, US universities. So yeah, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I just love what Rosie said there. You let chat GPT to write all academic articles. Probably, probably do it better than I can. And then we can have all these chat GPT assessors. And I'm sure you could have a, a wonderful Ivy League of citing each other. And then we can get on with life. Yeah. Sorry, Michelle, I forgot the last question. I, I got carried away with that, that thing yeah. on chat GPT. That's fine. I will actually let Angus ask uh, his question instead. We can come back to my question. Yeah. yeah. Angus, don't ask me a question. Don't ask me a question. Give me a thought. Yeah, it is a thought. Um, I, don't, I, know we're, I know we're saying this a little bit tongue in cheek, but um, I just need to challenge the idea that AI is in any way neutral and not supporting the exact kind of colonial systems we're talking about because the kind of linguistic models that it's built on are like when Trump gets a million likes on a tweet, for example, like that's all baked into it. So yeah, it'd be it'd be pretty sweet if something like objective and uh -huh. transparent as well. I mean, I was trying to think of it in terms of the um like whether it's rhizomatic or Mm. Arboreal, like I think, I think it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing in that respect. It's kind of, you know, it's the internet and it pulls so much stuff in, and it's built on this huge like model that we can't possibly as humans understand. But the things underpinning it are like, yeah, yeah, absolutely hierarchical and absolutely oppressive as well. Yeah, but you know, Angus, you're right. I mean, look, you know, we're all panicking about should we reference, uh, you know, AI? Should we reference ChatGPT? But mm. But isn't that kind of what we're doing anyway, <laughs> in some senses, yeah? Uh, and and, and yeah. doesn't the fact that chat, that, chat, that, 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 that innocence, that for me, that just is a mirror into what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just doing it much, much more extreme with chat GPT. Because what is it? It's the collection of certain privileged uh, self-referent knowledges. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what uh, elite citation systems are about? That's I'm being provocative here. I'm I'm, I'm sure that yeah, it's not just that. Um, I mean, when you read some of these, um, I hope they're not psychologists, but I've seen so many psychology articles where you've got like ten authors. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ontologically impossible, for, I think, for ten people to write an article. <laughs> so what's going on? It's trying to boost up citations. Yeah, yeah. You have professors who who produce thirty articles a year which again, is probably impossible to do. And you know what they're doing is other people writing the article and they're sticking their name on it because they want to secure the ref. So, so this isn't a game, this is fraud, but we call it a game. But when students rip something off, then we, 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 we penalize them. So we need to understand this infrastructure and how it works, yeah? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I mean, I've got an answer to that, but you know, you know, I think that rhizomatic thinking maybe is one. But will we uh, do we have the courage to think rhizomatically? I'm not sure because we've been so conditioned to think hierarchically. And it's really difficult when you're advising students on referencing as well. Exactly, because we might get know, penalised. We might get penalised. Yeah. So we we teach we teach sessions on um, like critical citation. At, I'm a librarian at Goldsmiths, and um, this question comes up every single time it's like well it's good to know it's good to we sit and we have a conversation about strategies that might disrupt some of these um bad citational practices that we've been talking about and then the students are like but you know i still want to get a good grade so <laughs> and that's a neoliberal logics are kicking in again yeah yeah, yeah exactly. which is this which is the same as these black people in an indian people who want you to become white because they're, they're they're operating the same kind of logic of capital racialized capital Mm -hmm. you know because that will give them a better chance of getting a job or a better chance of getting in bollywood or whatever siobhan do you want to jump in 
Um, yeah, I think it's less of a question, more of seeing what you think about this, because I've often thought when we think about citation, whether it makes an authorship combined, whether it makes more sense doing something like, I'm not sure if you like Goffman's theory of speech, where we talk about the author, the producer, <laughs> and like the person to whom the statement is then contributed. So one person actually just a saying, the writer, then that is the person who has created the statement, the author in a way, and then like the principal to whom the statement belongs. And mm. whether a model like that is helpful for citational practices, because I think and I, I wonder what you thought about that, because it would allow on one hand for technicians and librarians to be credited as having contributed to a piece, but also to, I think, work on like the 10 author statement and kind of specify what people have done. But then that is still the gamification issue and whether we just is, yeah. remaking the exact same thing that we have yeah. currently in the author and citations. We will. I think I've got a colleague uh, uh, who was at Coventry, Luca, uh, who's done a lot of stuff on game theory, and he, he, you would just get new new ways in which that game gets played out. I mean, in that sense, I suppose going back to the Audrey Lord Masters tools, maybe we have to change the game altogether. Yeah, uh, you know, the game itself. I don't know. Have you ever played Monopoly? You know. Somebody always ends up getting rich and everybody else gets poor, you know, everybody, somebody earns all the kind of expensive streets. Uh, and you could say it's a random thing, but you know, and that's kind of what happens in writing and publishing, you know. So just, we need to burn the monopoly board, maybe. We need to destroy capitalism, maybe. I don't know, we might end up with a worse system, but I think that's what uh, Naomi said. And it was refreshing that she said she came from a conservative background. Now she's a, she's a Marxist revolutionary, which uh, gives me hope. <laughs> uh, brilliant. I think we've got um, two minutes left uh, of the session. So if anybody else has a final question or thought, um, please do ask. Um, I haven't seen anything else in the chat that I haven't asked already. Yeah. We've got people I saying mean, they hate Monopoly, which, you know, fair. <laughs> I mean, Michelle, just to kind of just say, I think in, in a sense, the world is as it is. You know, we, we cannot, we, when we need to imagine other worlds, I think we do need to do that, but we have to deal with the world as it is. And that's why I think, you know, I mentioned we have to fight a war of position, which is, well, we, we can make small changes, we can influence things. We know that we're not kind of doing everything in a perfect world. Um, in fact, if, if, if that was the case, then we wouldn't actually having these conversations because the world would just find its own perfect solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's something, you know, again, we've talked about over the past couple of years. And I'm sure mm -hmm. Gus, John, I think we've been influenced by as well. He's always said that, like, you can yeah. always try and make incremental change. You're never going to so, solve yeah. the issues, but you mm -hmm. can always try, uh, try mm -hmm. and make your bit of progress in the time. Mm -hmm. you have. Yeah. And, and I also, I, I, this is a personal thing. I mean, you know, I come, uh, statistically, I should not be talking now. Statistically, I, should possibly be, have been locked up or mental asylum or something, or I don't know, deported or something, I don't know, self-harmed. But something happened and it might just be like winning the lottery. I think for, you know, I think I probably won the lottery, but um, I know the transformative power of education in spite of all these kind of technologies that keep pushing you down. And that's what we need to hold on to, you know? And those single cases make a, make a lot of difference because they make you feel like you are doing something yeah yeah and, and, and for, I think for librarians and for people on the front line that's often the most rewarding thing isn't it for somebody to say to you and I I don't know about you but on LinkedIn I got students from 30 years ago saying you know you transformed the way I worked and this and when you get that that kind of does put fuel into into your you know engine and you keep going you say you're not mad there's something useful that you're doing there so that i think at a personal level we all have if we want to struggle in this space that's we need those affirmations yeah and we shouldn't be too disheartened if somebody says well it's nothing you know it's a drop in the ocean um we're dealing with structures and history and capitalism yeah but that doesn't mean that we've lost agency altogether and if education is about anything it's about nurturing agency yeah yeah 
That is a brilliant note to finish on. So thank you so much, Gurnan, for joining thank us you. today. That was a brilliant keynote. And I'm sure everybody in the chat is going to say thank you too. Um, yeah. I think we've put your slides and your script that you sent us on yep. the website. Yep. So uh, lots to think about there. We've recorded the session, so that will go up sometime in June as well. Uh, but you. please do join me in thanking Gurnan. Uh, please unmute yourself if you'd like, or just uh, join us thank in the chat to say thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, Thank so we'll, we'll be back at 2.15 for the next session, so please do enjoy your next 10 to 13 minutes, <laughs> go outside, get yourself an ice cream, grab yourself something to eat, and we will see you at 2.15.